Good morning, New Song. Welcome to our second virtual worship here on Sunday, although today is actually Friday. Um, just a couple announcements before we get started with our worship. Um, we are going to continue our virtual worship through uh, this Sunday, which is why we're here. Uh, secondly, there is going to, going to be an announcement coming out with a link to sign up for communion uh, in a fashion where pastor will conduct it individually or as a family. So this link will allow you to sign up for certain time slots where we can still maintain the social dis distancing recommendations, uh, but also allow our congregation the opportunity to commune. Uh, thirdly, given the continued coronavirus pa pandemic and the need for social dis distancing, we are going to cancel the Easter celebration uh, that we have in the coming weeks. Uh, we believe this is obviously a responsible uh, decision, just given the, the need to keep people separate. So uh, we are canceling the Easter celebration, uh, which is that Saturday before Easter Sunday. Thank you. Today's scripture reading is taken from Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 15. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. Yes, it is, as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of? But Jesus made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate, knowing it was, one, it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release, to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews, Pilate asked him. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
us make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pause for a moment of personal and private confession. We confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us join together in making confession of our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's bring our attention back to that lesson that Steve read earlier from the Gospel of St. Mark, the 15th chapter. I want to pick up just reading at the ninth verse. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews, Pilate asked, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. It was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to Pilate. These are difficult times for all of us. We're not even gathering together as brothers and sisters in Christ in the house of God to offer Him our worship and praise. Our lives are disrupted. In many ways, they're being turned upside down. The kids are at home. They're not in school. They're not being taught by their teachers, but instead they're in front of a screen. And we're all doing our best to adjust to that fact and to try to become part-time teachers to help them learn the lesson, to get the assignments done. It's causing a certain amount of stress to rise in our homes. I'm going to guess there are a certain number of us listening to this sermon who had developed plans for spring break. You and the kids were going to go to some place. You were going to do something. You were going to have some fun. Maybe you'd thought about this. Maybe you'd planned this for quite a while. Finally, this was the year. Uh, one of your children is a senior in high school or in college, and you all want to do this wonderful Thing together, but all those plans now have been canceled. Maybe your work has been cut back 
or close completely. And maybe that's put a special financial strain upon you and your home. Or you might be the other end of the spectrum. You might be in one of those key occupations where you're not only working, you're working overtime. You're putting in extra hours because it is necessary for you to function that way in this time of crisis and need. We've all gone to the store only to find all these shelves are bare and empty. Necessities, the things you need to negotiate life, uh, toilet paper, it's just not there. And you begin to stress about that. Your supply is getting smaller and smaller and you keep going back to the store and they don't have any and you keep going back and they don't have any and the stress levels are rising. And while you're going through that stressful reality, you realize in your mind and in your heart that there are plenty of people out there who have hoarded toilet paper. They're stockpiling these essential supplies. They made sure that they have all that they need and more, which has created scarcity, need, and stress in your life. And so you think to yourself, this just doesn't fare. And you wonder, what did I do to deserve this? Why why am I experiencing this? And we begin to have questions like, well, who's to blame for these shortages and my loss of income and the spread of this disease? And in the midst of all of that stress, we can begin to develop negative feelings and negative emotions. And those negative emotions can create a sense of bitterness within us. And that's what I want to talk about today, a warning that in the midst of a time of high stress, concern, and even fear, that we do not grow bitter. Bitter, it has been said, is like poison. Bitter is a poison that I drink and then sit back and wait for you to die. Bitter, it's been said, is like digging a hole. And every day you go out and you dig and you dig and you dig and you dig deeper every day. Failing to realize that the deeper and the deeper and the deeper and the deeper you dig, the path out of that hole is getting longer and longer and longer. The path out of that bitterness The path to health and wellness is getting longer and more difficult each day. Now you're saying, how does that tie into the text that you read? Well, I think Caiaphas and the high priest and the chief priest were bitter. And I think they acted the way they acted in Holy Week out of bitterness. Think about Caiaphas for a moment. He has waited, he has anticipated the time when finally he would be appointed high priest. He has paid his dues. And now is the moment. Finally he is the high priest. Now is the moment that he should be able to walk through the streets of Jerusalem and everybody would stop and admire him because he is the singularly most important religious figure in their faith. He should have fame. That would bring him a sense of fortune and wealth that he could accumulate during this time frame and accumulate enough wealth so that he and his family would be set for the rest of their life. Now is the moment for him to seize this opportunity and to build that wealth. Now is the time for him to finally have the power and be able to exercise it as the high priest. All the things he's thought about, all the things he's dreamed about, and all the things he anticipated are supposed to be realized in this moment. He is the high priest. But so much of that is not happening. So much of it has been taken away from him. The admiration, the devotion, the respect, and the honor is going to someone else. 
what we call Palm Sunday was this incredible, spontaneous explosion of praise and adoration and worship. But not of Caiaphas, but Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus entered into the temple area and overturned all the money changers. He overturned the economic system which is supposed to bring wealth to Caiaphas and his family. All the people are shouting his praises. All the people are admiring him. And we read in this text in Mark 15, Caiaphas is envious or you could translate it jealous or you could translate it bitter. He has developed a lot of negative emotions because what he wanted, what he expected, what he thought he deserved is not happening. And somebody has to be blamed and somebody has to be held responsible and somebody has to pay. And should our hearts start looking for something negative to happen to another. When we, in the midst of our pain, want pain to come into someone else's life, when we who are suffering want someone else to suffer, and we would find some sense of satisfaction in that, we would feel better because they are struggling. That is the essence of bitterness. And that's what Pilate recognized in Caiaphas. In the midst of this time of struggle and suffering and fear and anxiety, in the midst of this global struggle against this virus, guard your heart against bitterness. Guard your heart against trying to figure out who's to blame, who's to be held responsible, who's going to pay for this. Because bitterness rarely gets better. We just dig the hole and dig the hole and dig the hole and the path back to health is longer and longer and longer. Pay attention to James chapter 3 verse 4. James writes, If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. If you harbor bitterness in your heart, James says, one of the results of that bitterness is to deny the truth. A bitter heart can't see truth. A bitter heart can't believe truth. And a bitter heart won't trust truth. And Caiaphas is an example of that reality. Pilate sees the bitterness in him. Pilate understands that Caiaphas wants Jesus to suffer. He wants Jesus to pay. He literally wants Jesus taken out of the way because Caiaphas is angry. Caiaphas is hurt. Caiaphas is jealous. And Caiaphas is bitter. But he can't see the truth. If you've been reading this story along with us and you've been reading through the Gospel of John, we came upon this incredible miracle where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. This man was dead for four days. Even his sister acknowledges that he's been in that grave so long, his body will have begun to decay and it will begin to stink. And she says, no, don't roll the stone away. Let's not humiliate my poor brother in this way. But Jesus calls this man out of the grave and he comes out resurrected, healthy, well, alive. And it's John's gospel that tells us that Lazarus is in the crowd on what we call Palm Sunday. One of the reasons thousands and thousands of people are joining that parade is they want to see the man who came back from the dead. 
They want to see him. They want to hear him. Is he going to tell us what it was like? Uh, is he going to share anything with us? And they come out to see the dead man now alive. This is an undeniable miracle. It is solid proof that Jesus' claims to be the Son of God are valid. He is who he says he is. Lazarus is the proof. There's no denying that. Unless you're bitter. And if you're bitter, you'll deny the truth. You can't see it. You can't believe it. You won't trust it. Guard your hearts in the midst of these scary, anxious, and stressful days. Are you struggling to see some essential truths? Are you struggling to see, are you struggling to believe in the goodness of God? When maybe you've lost your job, you can't find the necessities on the shelf, the kids being at home and you not having a job and everybody being quarantined in the house and the stress level in your family is rising and rising. Are you struggling to see the goodness of God? Are you struggling to trust in the power of God to rescue us, to deliver us, and to bring us through and out of this crisis? Are you struggling in your prayer life? Do you believe that God hears your prayers? Do you believe that God will answer your prayers? Do you believe that God can do the impossible if you ask him? All these wonderful promises in the word about the power of prayer, in the midst of the anxiety, in the midst of the fear, in the midst of the stress, are you struggling to see, to believe, and to trust in the promises of God about the power of prayer? Jesus told us the truth would set us free. Only the truth can set us free. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth itself. Can you see Jesus, trust Jesus, and believe in Jesus in the midst of the fear and the stress and the anxiety? Guard your hearts carefully, lest we succumb to all the negative and destructive realities that consumed Caiaphas and led him to demand the death of an innocent man. The Apostle Paul wrote to us in Ephesians chapter 4, get rid of all bitterness, get rid of rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of malicious behavior. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. In the midst of this critical time, I think there is one essential truth we need to see to believe, and to trust. The basic Bible story. God created a perfect universe. God created man and woman, and he created them with perfect health, with perfect minds and perfect hearts to know and to love. He gave them a perfect relationship between himself, between one another, and between them and the rest of creation. And they were going to live in this perfect knowledge and this perfect love and a perfect world forever and ever and ever and ever. It was never going to end. And then one day, they rejected all of that for a piece of fruit. One ripe fruit and we threw it all away. Now in that 
world, in that reality, could you really blame God if he became bitter? We pursued other gods. We pursued other things. We elevated the thoughts, the desires, the treasures of this world. We elevated them in importance and priority over the Creator. We rejected Him. We rebelled against Him. We disobeyed. We did our own thing. And we became indifferent to His desires. We just didn't think about it. We just didn't care. Generation after generation after generation. But God did not become bitter. Because God never lost sight of the truth. He stayed focused on the truth. The truth he knew is that we are his children. Yes, we are rebellious. Yes, we are sinners. Yes, we reject him. Yes, we've run away from home. Yes, yes, yes. But still, we are his children. And he is our father. He kept focused on the truth. Despite all that we have become, despite all that we have done, He loves us with a love that is boundless and immeasurable. The truth he was focused on was a commitment to rescue us, to deliver us, to save us from ourselves. And he committed his son, Jesus, to accomplish this task, to win our salvation, and sent him into this world sent him to a cross, the blood that he would shed would wash us clean and reconcile us with our Father. And his resurrection from the dead would win victory over death and grave that we might not only be restored as the children of God, cleansed and forgiven in the blood of Christ, but that we might have a relationship with our Father and that we might have a home to return to. This blessed reunion at home was the truth he stayed focused on. It was the truth he worked to accomplish. It's the truth of the gospel of Jesus, and he would never lose his focus. There's a hymn that says, At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, And the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. At the cross, I received my sight. He washed away all my stress. He washed away all my anxiety. He washed away all my fear. He washed away all my sin and rebellion and disobedience. And I saw the truth. I saw the love of God, the commitment of God, the salvation of God. I saw the forgiveness of my sins. I saw Jesus. We're not only in the midst of of a great global health crisis. But more importantly, we're also in the midst of Lent. A time for all of us to fix our eyes on Jesus. A time for us to gather at the cross and see the truth. We are the Father's children and we will go home. And it's that truth that will calm us, rescue us, strengthen us, and deliver us from these days. Amen. Let's gather our hearts, our minds in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we want to pray for all those who are struggling in this crisis. We want to pray for all those who have lost loved ones. And to that long list across our nation and across the world, most especially today, we want to pray for Angie Eichhorn and all in her family as Angie mourns the loss of both her mom and grandma. We pray that all those who grieve and mourn in this time would be lifted up by Jesus Christ. That he would draw them to an empty tomb, that they would hear again the message of Easter. He is not here, he is risen. He has conquered death and grave. And all who believe in him, even though they die, yet shall they live. And all who die in faith enter into the presence of our Heavenly Father where they will be with him for all eternity. And all the struggles and the trials, all the pain is gone. And they know only the beauty and the blessedness of God. Give them this hope. Give them this vision through our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you give wisdom and discernment to our leaders, to President Trump, to Governor Pritzker, to all our mayors, our city councils, our senators and our congressmen and women. Give them the knowledge and insight they need to combat this crisis. Give them a spirit of cooperation and unity that we might come together to defeat a common foe. We pray for wisdom and discernment to be given to all those who are in the medical fields, to those who are trying to find cures and a vaccine, to the doctors and nurses who are on the front lines caring for patients. Watch over them, bless them, and keep them all safe. Help them, Lord, uh, to have the strength they need to put in the very long hours that are required of them in this moment. Let us lift them up in our prayers and in our hearts. For all those who are struggling with employment and starting to experience some serious financial crisis, let us put our faith in you and trust you to provide all that we need in our daily bread. For all the sick, whether they're struggling with the coronavirus or something else, we lift them all before your holy throne. And here in our own family of faith, we pray for Jan and Debbie, for Kimber's niece, for Beth and Ron, Luke and Irv, for Brian, for Sean, for Trent. Hear our prayer, Lord, and in the name of Jesus, grant them all a whole, quick, and complete recovery from all that afflicts them of body and soul. You chasten and yet you heal. Give them patience while we await your deliverance and answer. Lord, we all have our own worries, our own concerns, our own anxieties at this time. And so we're going to pause for a moment of personal prayer. And as we pause in this moment, we also ask you, Holy Spirit, to gather up all those concerns that we struggle to put into words and intercede on our behalf at the throne of our Father. We join together in the prayer our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.